Welcome to the season one finale of News Points on the Air. I'm your host, Milan Medley. It has been my absolute pleasure to host our 18 episodes that have featured incredible guests and have prompted engaging, thought-provoking conversation. And with this, our final episode of this season, we're going to talk about dinosaurs. That's right, dinosaurs. Dr. Art Chadwick is the guest for this episode. He is the co-director of the Dinosaur Excavation at Tephonomy Research Project at Southwestern Adventist University. He is also the director of the Dinosaur Science Museum and Research Center, also at the same university. He is here to talk about his decades of experience as a geologist, biologist, and professor, and his ongoing work of uncovering, analyzing, and collecting data at one of the largest dinosaur bone beds in the world. Dr. Chadwick, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Excellent. So let's dive right in. When did you, or what first led you to the world of biology and geology? That's a, an interesting question. Not real quick to answer, but I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> That's fine. I originally was uh, in high school. I was a, a pretty badly behaved kid. And I kind of got the idea that maybe if I became a priest, I would... Uh, I would uh, make it up with God, and He would He would let me into heaven. <laughs> so I went to my I went to my priest, and I asked him what I should do to be if I wanted to study for the ministry. Hmm. And he gave me uh, it was a God thing. He gave me the the most effusive and useless answers I could ever imagine. When I left there, I was more confused than ever. <laughs> So I went to my high school guidance counselor and she said, she had been an, uh, a missionary in Africa. And she said, well, if you want to help the people in Africa, you should go into, into medicine, not into, not into history or whatever ministry was. Hmm. And uh, so I said, okay, well, I guess I have to do science. So that was my first trip. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even know that God was leading me at that point, but uh, hmm. I went off to a secular university and started taking science. And of course, I never look back. I love science. And it was a perfect fit for me. And uh, then while I was there as a freshman, actually, I met a young man who was uh, a Catholic. And he was studying with an Adventist physician, studying um, the Bible. And he invited me to share in that experience. And it wasn't very long after that that I realized he was studying with a Seventh-day Adventist physician. Hmm. And I realized that everything that I had doubts and questions about in the Bible made sense in, from the Adventist perspective. And it made so much sense that there was nothing I could do but just uh, join the Adventist church. So while I was a freshman in college, I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Uh, I went to that university for another year, and then I thought I should probably go to an Adventist school if I wanted to to learn all the things I hadn't learned as a young man. Mm. So I went to last year college at that time, and I took a course there in philosophy of science from uh, Dr. Lloyd Downs, and I was so impressed with the issues of origins that I became very interested in not going into medicine, but going into science. So uh, with the encouragement of Dr. Downs, he, he told me, let, let these other guys do, do medicine. You go do something worthwhile with your life. <laughs> <laughs> Those are his words, not mine. <laughs> My kids are all physicians. So um, <laughs> look at that. I appreciate that. But for me, it was an opening of a door that I, I probably wouldn't have opened otherwise. So wow. uh, I went off to graduate school. And in, in those days, it seemed like molecular biology was a new science. And it seemed like that's probably the area that would lead me to understand the issues of creation and evolution the best. So I went off to the only program in the country at that time 
was at University of Miami, so that's why I went to graduate school. And I finished that course. And when I was completed my degree, looking back on it, I realized that everything I had learned in molecular biology was about creation. It had nothing to do with evolution. And so I figured I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. So while I was doing a postdoc, I started taking geology classes. And then I started work at Loma Linda University and I went to University of California and finished my degree in geology, my training in geology. And then I went to University of Oklahoma as a, a research professor, visiting professor, and uh, did some work there. So I was a professional geologist by the time I really hit the ground. <laughs> nice. You said something really interesting um, that when you were studying molecular biology, I think it was what you were mentioning, you were learning more about creation or you saw more creation. What do you mean by that? Well, there's just no way that a person who understands molecular biology and cellular biology could believe that that happened by accident. Hmm. Uh, People that believe that are stretching faith a long ways. Interesting. Wow. Wow. So when, okay, so we know now, so I'm, I'm making a couple, one leap, and then we're going to come back. And the leap is dinosaurs, right? Because up until now, at least in what you've shared so far, dinosaurs weren't a primor, primary focus. So when did dinosaurs come to play? Uh, when I had come to Keene, Texas, to Southwestern Adventist University, uh, I was working on several projects. One of them was a, a project down in Peru on working on the taphonomy of fossil whales. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use taphonomy, so I better define it. I was just about to ask you. It is. <laughs> taphonomy is the, it's what crime scene investigators do. They they look at a crime scene and they try to understand what the victim was doing when they died, how they died, and then what happened to them after they died, how long ago did they die, and so on. So taphonomists are people that study uh, fossil evidence for that aspect of the life of the organism. So what was it doing when it died? How did it die? What happened after it died? Uh, clear on down to the time that it's excavated. And that's what we were doing with fossil whales in Peru. Wow. And a friend of mine had been in contact with a rancher up in Wyoming who had dinosaurs on his property. It turns out they had had a secular paleontologist there and the paleontologist wanted to build a field station on his ranch. Hmm. And he said, that would be fine to build the field station, but uh, you've been telling all these little kids you bring from town about evolution. Uh, I don't want my bones to be used to teach evolution because I'm a creationist. So he said, if you'll tell them about creation also, then, uh, then I'll give you permission. And the evolutionist just said, no way. And so he left on unfriendly terms with the rancher. Hmm. Uh, so uh, the rancher contacted Institute of Creation Research in San Diego, and they contacted me. And because I was working on these whales in, in Peru, I wasn't that interested. Hmm. So I contacted a friend of mine who was a vertebrate paleontologist, and he went out and looked at it. And he invited me to come out and look. And I'll never forget when I was in the truck of the rancher, he drove up onto one of the ridges and said, let's get out. And I opened the door and I couldn't walk on the ground without walking on dinosaur bones. Whoa. It was such a shocking thing to me that it really turned my head around. I didn't need another project right then, but I couldn't stand the idea of all these data, dinosaur bones being washed away and lost to science. So I said, at least I have to come up myself to trying to preserve some of these data. So that's how I originally got involved in the project. <laughs> wow. How did they end up up there? Well, that's the dinosaurs. <laughs> that may be a really, you know, I, I oversimplified that, I'm sure. But 
when you say Wyoming, it's like I would have never, my mind would not have naturally gone there. Well, that's that's just a part of this area in central United States, central and western United States, where there are deposits uh, that are the right layers hmm. that are uh, terrestrial deposits, and they have dinosaurs in them. So that includes Colorado and Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and up to Montana and uh, and Wyoming and South Dakota, and uh, that, that's about it. That whole region is, has lots of dinosaurs. And the reasons wow. for that are speculative. We just published a paper on this, a major paper, mm -hmm. trying to explain that. So I won't try to explain it here. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfectly fair. Okay. So, um, and listeners, we're going to get more into dinosaurs soon. So let's hang on a second. I, I want to get into some common misconceptions about, because you've, you've already hinted at it. Well, not um, specifically, but what are some common misconceptions um, about Christian scientists or Christian Christianity and science, especially in your field? And why do you think many people kind of put the two at odds, Christianity and science, like they can't work or a Christian can't be a scientist? Well, that's unfortunate, but it's largely colored by untrained creationists who talk about evolutionists in a bad way. And if I were an evolutionist, I suspect I would be hostile toward those kinds of creationists anyway. Um, they give us the idea that they have all the answers to all the questions and that evolutionists are stupid. Well, hmm. evolutionists aren't stupid and they don't have all the answers to the questions, to all the questions. So it really makes a bad, puts a bad attitude in the air. And it has turned, as I said, a lot of scientists away from creationists. In fact, when I started into this field uh, working on dinosaurs, the first 10 years or so, I would get papers at national meetings on our research, which was cutting edge. Uh, and nobody would say a word to me. But after hmm. about 10, 10 years or so, people began to realize that we're staying there. We're doing good work. In fact, in some respects, our work is better than that of other evolutionary biologists. So uh, they have become friends with us. And, and in a recent meeting, a vertebrate paleontology meeting, I was carrying on a conversation on spiritual topics with, with two of these very prominent evolutionists. Wow. So, so that's, that's part of the problem. The other mm. part is that a lot of people that get degrees that are creationists don't really keep doing research for some reason. That's mostly through the years, it's been Dr. Brand and myself, Dr. Brand at Loma Linda University and myself uh, have been doing a lot of, a large part of the work. Uh, but more recently, some students of Dr. Brand's have uh, gone out and started programs in other universities and, and are producing science rich student, students that are doing uh, good science and they themselves are doing good science. So the picture is gradually changing. Wow. And when you said, you know, um, some creationist scientists, they're not researching anymore. What would additional science, um, I mean, additional research, my bad, um, what would that reveal to them? How would that change their perspective? Well, I don't think that's the issue. I think it's just okay. that they, they probably go into teaching or something else and they don't okay. really continue to do research. Or if they do, they're not doing research that is in the interface between uh, the issues of origins. So they don't really get into this at all. And, and in fact, there are a lot of scientists out there that are that are Christians mm -hmm. that just don't even think about evolution. They're doing molecular biology or something else. And mm -hmm. it's just not an issue in their field. However, Dr. Brand and I have taken on uh, a frontal assault on, on the hard issues and spent most of our careers doing that. You have been at 
South, Southwestern Adventist University for almost 40 years now. And prior to that, you worked at Loma Linda and also University of Oklahoma. What do you enjoy most about teaching? Well, there's, there's no doubt that it's the students. Mm. <laughs> it's so great to have young people that are enthusiastic and interested in what's going on uh, who have a future. And it's my goal to try to shape that future in a way that will promote the gospel, hmm. encourage them to do more than just make a living with their, with their, uh, with their training. And when did you first uh, decide you wanted to teach? Like in addition to researching, when did teaching get added to the table? Well, while I was at Loma Linda, I was doing primarily doing research and I had made some statements about that, that science teachers should be doing research. <laughs> and uh, I was challenged on that statement because I, of course, was, I was in the graduate school. So my goal was to do research. And I was challenged by people that were teaching who said, well, we just don't have time. Hmm. So I took that challenge and, and <laughs> decided I would come to Southwestern and, and continue to do research. And that's what I've done. Awesome. So now we'll, we'll talk a little more about the dinosaur, dinosaur research project. And you begun to um, talk about a little bit of how you became involved in the specific area where you guys conduct your research out in Wyoming. Um, what year was that initially when you were first exposed to that um, all that data, as you put it, and I think that's so cool. Um, but when did you decide you wanted to link that with the university and start to bring students up there? Uh, that was in 1996 that I first went out there. And then 1997, uh, we had our first class. And then 1999, and after 2000, we just continued to grow until uh, today. This last season, we had nearly 200 people out there. Wow. For at least part of the time, yeah. So what was its initial, when you brought students out there initially, what exactly were you having them do? And what was kind of like the objective of the, of the project? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my first goal was to try to save data. Mm -hmm. And in, a, in connection with that, I wanted to save as much data as I could. And so we developed the technology using uh, GPS, high resolution GPS to map the bones so that we could actually reproduce the oh. in the computer. So you can, you can see where every bone is. Wow. And this allows us, uh, we didn't know this at the time, but it's turned out to be uh, very useful scientifically because it allows us to do research in the computer we can huh. ask questions of the quarries and uh, we can get the answers out of the computer. So that we pioneered that work and we've been doing it now for 20, 21 years, I guess. So we have a lot of data. Yeah. <laughs> so has the mission broadened? I guess, how has it changed since? And, you know, on top of preserving data, what else are... Um, what else are you hoping to accomplish? Well, it, it did broaden beyond the initial idea of saving bones because when we, when we first arrived there, the secular scientists had been there, who had been there said that, that the, the, the day he left was the last day science would be done on the Hanson Ranch. So he was saying that if he wasn't there, if, if there were a bunch of creationists in there, there hmm. wasn't going to be any, any science done. Wow. And uh, so that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. If we were going to do regular science, that's one thing. But we decided with God's help, we would undertake to do science at a higher level. And so we introduced electronics and all this GPS and GIS information systems into the, into the mix. And now we have these huge capabilities uh, with a database of 30,000 bones. Wow which is, which is a, a huge number of bones. So we, we have 
done far more than he ever thought about doing in terms of science. Mm -hmm. Given papers, probably 20 or more papers in national meetings. We published about eight papers so far in the scientific literature, and we're just getting started. Wow, this is so cool. So, so cool. So about, so you guys started the, pro, or you started the project in late 90s. How many digs have you taken students on? I think we said 25. Wow, okay. And um, you said this last one, he had 200. That's incredible. Yeah, those are not students, those are participants. I see, I see, okay. That's still we a lot have, of people. <laughs> yeah, we have about 10 students per year. It averages out around 10. Okay. That are taking the class for credit. I see. Uh, but we have um, Corey leaders and we have staff and we have people that want to just come out and dig mm -hmm. that make up the difference. How do the students react, especially if they're, go they're going out for the first time when they see the fossils, when they see the computer images? How do they typically respond? Well, I had one, uh, one uh, person that came out who was a professor, had a PhD in biology. Hmm. And the day after he arrived and he had gone out into the field and dug for a day, he called back to his home country and told all his colleagues that dinosaurs were real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, that was, a, that was uh, kind of eye-opening to me because I had no idea. It was so, so widely, uh, widely thought that dinosaurs weren't real. <laughs> but, uh, having seen the bones and handled them, yeah. no, no doubt that they indeed existed. <laughs> yeah, you're so far removed from the line of thinking that dinosaurs didn't exist. Yeah, it, that is still like a, a held opinion. I don't know how widely, but, um, and these bones, um, I hadn't had this on our original questions, but about how big, like it does it range? Like, are you seeing like, I don't even know how to, in my mind, guess how big these bones are. So about how big is the biggest bone and small? What What is the size differential? Well, the... the Largest bones we take out are usually the femur. That's the mm. upper leg bone. Yeah. And the largest one that uh, we have found, also the largest uh, duck bill dinosaur femur that is known, was 54 inches. So that's uh, about oh, wow. a meter and a half. Yeah. Roughly. <laughs> that's, that's. And that's just insane. one bone. <laughs> that's just one bone. And incredible. So, okay, you, that, you recently. And then the smallest things we get are our teeth, mm. are a millimeter or less. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, you recently came back from a dig a couple of weeks ago. What was that dig like, especially um, considering, you know, COVID 19 conditions? So, how that how the dig is dif was different in that respect, but also what would you what were you guys able to uncover? Well, we we had decided in two thousand that we were going to go ahead and hold the dig. We would just uh, be a little more careful about in twenty twenty in twenty twenty. Yeah, uh, we'd just be a little more careful about uh, getting out there, and at, at that point, nobody had been vaccinated, so uh, there was that risk. But we just. We just said, we're going to do it anyway. We're out there in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and it would be easy to isolate the camp. So we had a wonderful season. Uh, none of our overseas guests were able to make it. Okay. So we, we had, uh, I think, probably 15 or so that were scheduled to come from all over the world. Uh, and then again, this year, they couldn't make it either because they couldn't get visas except for two, we had one from, mm -hmm. one from uh, Nairobi, one from, uh, sorry, from Nigeria and one from uh, Northern Africa. Wow. Wow. So what were you guys um, able to find? Anything surprising? Um, or what was the dig like? Uh, it was a great year. We had the largest number of participants ever. I guess uh, the fact that people have been bundled up for so long made them all. <laughs> We had, we had uh, as I said, almost 200 people come out. 
Yeah. For varying amounts of time. We had a steady population of maybe 50 or 60, and then we had these bursts uh, up, to, up to 90 or so for a few days. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we're used to it. We know how to handle them. Mm -hmm. and we had a lot of good help in, in camp, which made it easy. But we found another site. Last year, we found a site that had an intact triceratops. We dug out a lot of that. Whoa. And that's the, that's the dinosaur. And I only know a little bit about dinosaurs because my brother was obsessed as a kid. <laughs> that's the one with the, the head that kind of looks like, well, with three kind of spikes around. Three, three horns. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> horns. Sarah means horn. So triceratops. Oh, okay. The, the uh, yeah. Wow, we, that's cool. We have, a, we have a skull we took out in 2014 that is seven feet from top to from the front to the back. Just the skull. Just the skull. It only weighs a thousand pounds. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they're they're really big. But wow. Last year we found a site where most of one animal was together in one spot. It was disarticulated but it was all in one pile. And then uh, we had a, a theory that we had developed about where to look for the next one. And uh, we applied that theory and we went and looked and found it. So, so we have, we have uh, validated our hypothesis. Nice. And we were able to find another site with a triceratops. Wow, it, this is just so fascinating. You have such, you do such cool and amazing work. Okay, so in addition to being the director of this project and teaching at Southwestern, you're also the director of the school's dinosaur science museum. When did that um, open, or when did you decide to uh, do that? Well, I, I should add here that Dr. Jared Wood is uh, co-director and, and co uh, co uh, organizer of the project. We work together, okay. and I want to make sure that the, when I'm gone, there's a project still going on. So this mm. has been a big deal to me. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I I uh, wanted to have this museum built because when I left, if there was nobody else to keep things going, what would happen mm. to all this collection of bones? So Dr. Wood and I have worked together on this. Yeah. Um, we started the museum in 2016. We opened it. Um, it is not a creation museum per se. Uh, we make it very clear that we believe in creation and that, that uh, we believe in the Bible account of creation. But the museum is designed to encourage students to be interested in science. Mm. So we talk mostly about our project and display the bones from the, that we've excavated. And it takes them through the whole pro process of excavation and how uh, the different kinds of things we find besides dinosaurs. Hmm. So look at some of the dinosaurs. Is it only for students? No, it's open to the public. And we have, I don't know, um, probably 30 or 40 people go, go through a day. Wow. That's a good number. And what do you hope, especially for students who may, uh, especially aside from students who may be more familiar, you know, having, going to, having gone to the school, so they may know more about the research project, but what do you hope visitors from the public, what impact do you hope the museum, museum has on them? Well, I, I think it's really important for us to demonstrate that Christians can do good science and that creationists are scientists. And that's the unstated uh, message that we hope carries through the whole museum. Mm. We, we start them out with uh, the thought that uh, we're creationists. And then we tell them about all the science we're doing. And I think at the end of that process, they come out feeling, oh, look, creationists can do science. Yeah. Hopefully, some of them will be interested in following after. You'd mention uh, your collection of 30,000 bones. I'm assuming some of the bones that have been accumulated over the years are on display at the museum, but the ones who, the ones that aren't, where are all those bones? It's a lot, a lot of data. <laughs> we have a repository 
back as part of the museum. Actually, you can see it. Uh, you have to have special access to get in, but you can see what's in the repository uh, where we keep these bones after they've been processed. Wow. What's something that you wish more people knew and understood about dinosaurs? Well, that they're real. For one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's, start there. Let's start there. Foundational. They they were real. <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of like people to see that they were killed catastrophically. Not mm. uh, they aren't just nor dying normally, but they're they're killed catastrophically. That's the only way we could get a deposit with with a million bones in it or more. Yeah, and seems like there were so many because in that strip of in the middle of America, as you described, there's been so much uncovered. So it's like, what else or where else um, are they? You know, if, if so many are found in this one area, a broad area, but one broad, you know, one area, how many more are out there around the world? Right. And, and uh, there are dinosaurs found on every continent. Hmm. Uh, one of the people that was here uh, this with us at the dig this summer is a geologist from Nairobi. And his objective in coming here was to learn how to deal with dinosaur bones because he wants to go back and find some dinosaurs in Nairobi. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> they have the right layers there. And uh, it's oh. just that he has, nobody's probably ever looked. Wow. That would be incredible if, you know, someone who was on your trip now inspired is able to find it <laughs> in Kenya, you know, that would be, that's incredible. Um, so, and, and I want to um, still stay on the subject, but take a little, a little turn because we're, you're talking about the layers of uh, the sites where you guys work. Um, I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine um, that the sites naturally see some wear, especially with when you have a lot of people, trained people, um, I would add, who know how to handle the environment and locations. But what about um, weather and climate changes, things that we can't control and professionals can't necessarily control? How has uh, climate change or changes, how have um, your sites been affected by climate changes? Well, I, I don't know that there have been any changes, but the climate certainly does its uh, does its chore on the on the bone beds. Yeah, they uh, they are eroded more every every year, which is mm. interesting. Brings up an interesting question: How long can these beds have been exposed right. and still be there? Because we've seen uh, just in the normal rain that we get, which isn't very much up there, fortunately, mm. uh, we've. Seen We've seen uh, erosion into the beds, in, uh, in, uh, cause, causing some loss, but not not certainly not more than it's been in the past. Okay, okay. So it's just kind of like natural wear with the natural, um, yeah, natural occurrences. Yeah. So there, so there could have been maybe like a hundred years ago, or so way more bones that could have been discovered. There were more bones, yes. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe a thousand. Yeah. yeah because, because they're eroding away every year. Yeah. What would you say to someone um, who doesn't go to Southwestern or doesn't live in the area, but is hearing this, watching this, and they're, they're like, like the person from Nairobi, I have to go there <laughs> or, or I have to go there or I need to learn more. How can they connect with you, the research project, the museum? What advice would you have? Well, first I, I would put them onto our websites which contain all the information that we get out of the ground uh, is on the website. It's mm. uh, it, our website, our museum website has been described by top paleontologists as the best website anywhere in the world for, for finding out about dinosaur bones. Wow. So, uh, again, I can't take credit for it. God put the things out there for us to use, mm -hmm. gave us the tools 
and encouraged us to do it. But on our website, you can see pictures of all the bones we have. We have three. All of them pictures. of that 30,000 that you'd mentioned. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we have 3D pictures that you can actually rotate with your mouse and see all the way around the bone. And we have virtual 3D images for thousands of them uh, that you can download and print the bone on your uh, 3D printer. Hmm. If you have one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, but you know, that's, that's good well, to know. I'm sure some people do. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no other website anywhere in the world that's, that's even remotely close to that. Yeah, yeah. But again, I say that not to brag. I, I don't have any bragging rights in this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God, has, God has given us wisdom and helped us to use it rightly. And uh, he has prospered us. So what would you say so, we touched? So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So your question was, how can people learn? Well, this year we had, I think, three or four students from Southern. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our project directors is the head of the biology department at, at Southern, Keith Snyder. And uh, he has been instrumental in, in getting us involved in a joint project. Um, we are very happy to have a sister institution on board. Mm -hmm. Welcome others. Uh, we welcome students from anywhere who'd like to take the class. And uh, we invite you to go to our website, which is just fossil.swau.edu. Or that's, that's the museum. Or if you want to go, it's dinosaur.swau.edu. That's not hard to remember. Yeah, no. So fossil.swau.edu and dinosaur.swau swau.edu. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. And I'll make sure to put that in the description for um, the audience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we touched on this briefly a couple minutes ago. What would you say the future of your profession of, and remind me how to pronounce it correctly, taphonomy? Is it taphonomy? Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. What does the future of it look like? Because even like you said, with um, with the site where you work up in Wyoming, you know, the climate and the weather, you know, it you can't escape it. Moving forward, what do you think the future of your site in particular will look like? Uh, well, we're in the process of building a permanent field station there. We had a field station that was built 20 years ago and last summer, uh, a mini tornado or something came through and took it out. So it was gone this year. Is that common? Do tornadoes typically no, go through there? I mean, I've seen a few out there, but it's not, it's not a worry. Wow. But uh, we brought in a couple of man camps from oil companies to, to use for uh, cooking and things. Mm -hmm. And then we, we all stayed in tents. But uh, we're building a permanent fuel station that will accommodate up to 125 people with a, a dining room and a kitchen and, and the internal facilities that we need to operate. And we'll still be sleeping in tents, but we'll have a, a nice building to, to gather in. Mm. So that's, a, that's a big part of this whole project. Okay. That'll be permanent because there are enough bones on this site to, for us to excavate as far in the future as anybody can see. Wow, wow. And there won't be any external factors you think that would affect your ability to carry out research there? Nothing, nothing that won't affect our ability to live. <laughs> yeah, oh but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not, not your, ability, your ability per se, but like, like this tornado, you know, the recent one and how that's not too common for the area. Um, anything well, along we, those lines that could happen. We have uh, sited the building at a place that's a little more protected uh, and out of the way than the place we were before, which was down in the middle of a valley. Yeah. It was, it was convenient, but it was also very exposed. Mm -hmm. We It's not unusual to have winds of 50 or 60 miles an hour and then have rain in the wind. And the yeah. Record, devastating um, if you don't have the right kind of equipment. And the bones, like how does it all affect, because I, I 
I don't know. I, I guess it depends on how deeply yeah. um, the bones are. They wouldn't be swept away or would yeah. they? Not likely, no. Okay, okay. The rain could, if we had a lot of rain, but they don't have much rain up there. If we had a lot of rain, it could affect our ability to work. Uh, but most years we've gotten away with maybe one or two days the whole year when it was too wet to work. Uh, this year we didn't have any. Mm, okay. So it's really nice, cooler than cooler than usual. Mm, okay. Very, very nice so uh, I have another question. Um, why do you think? Because I know, like I said, my brother, like growing up, he was obsessed with dinosaurs. Um, it seems like a lot of young boys and some girls, but it's typically like boy toy sections, it's dinosaurs, you know, it's a lot of people relegate obsession with dinosaurs to like childhood activities, childhood preoccupations, child, you know, yes, of course, you're a kid, dinosaurs, yeah, 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 but it's abandoned, the older people get, it seems, but here you are making a career. Why do you think people tend to abandon their fascination, maybe not even fascination because it's a fascinating topic, but like their passion to pursue their interests in a professional way. Why do you think there's that disconnect? Um, I, I think just about every guy, and, and as you say, some girls, but mostly guys uh, is into dinosaurs when they're young. Mm -hmm. and then they, they discover girls and that's the end of it. <laughs> so, but but out of that pack of 50 kids there are two or three that are going to want to be paleontologists by that time because they know the names of all the dinosaurs mm -hmm. so they go on and those are the ones that we're training right now we had i i would say four or five young people this summer who are up and coming paleontologists who have committed their lives to that kind of career. And it's probably largely because of their interest in dinosaurs as a kid. And mm -hmm. then the ability to come out here in a Christian setting and study dinosaurs in the field. And so we, we provide the next step for them uh, into a professional career. And we have a graduate school at Loma Linda University in the Earth and Biological Sciences Department, where they can get a PhD studying dinosaurs. We have uh, we have one of our students that has uh, who's now teaching at Loma Linda University in the anatomy department, who got our PhD on our project. Wow. Another one went off to another university and started a geology program there, mm. bringing students back now. And uh, this summer we had one graduate student out there working on their dissertation. So we have that ability because we have been there for a long time and we know what we're doing. About how, is there an age requirement for, um, to participate? Not really if you have your parents. Okay. If, if you're by yourself, you have to be old enough to, take the dinosaur class, which means you finished your uh, junior year in high school. Okay. So if you if you register as a student at Southwestern and then take the dinosaur class, you can be the high school age and still come by yourself. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing um, your incredible work. And uh, it's just so exciting. Any any final thoughts Any about dinosaurs, about your work, about the future of your profession. Any last words? Well, uh, my daughter perhaps says it best. She says, Dad, you've never worked a day in your life mm -hmm. because I enjoy doing what I do so much. Um, I would disagree with her. I think grading tests is, is <laughs> only <laughs> <laughs> but, but most of what I do is research yeah. And I love doing research and because I'm learning stuff that nobody knew before. So it's really mm -hmm. exciting. And uh, I, I hope to continue that as long as God gives me strength. Well, thank you so much. It's a perfect, 
perfect note to end on. Thank you again, Dr. Chadwick, for your time. It was my pleasure. And just like that, we've come to the end of season one of News Points on the Air. And it's also my final episode as its host. The show is going to take a little break, but it will be back later this year with season two. You'll have a new host, but the show will have the same mission. And that is to deliver timely, relevant conversations with Adventists throughout the North American territory that share how they're making positive contributions to their communities. In order not to miss out on season two, you have to be subscribed to our podcast. And that's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And while you're there, give us a five-star rating and write a glowing review. I want to give special thanks to the show's executive producers, Dan Weber, Julio Munoz, and Kimberly Moran, without whom the show would not have been possible. Thank you for your support and your encouragement during this time of producing the show. I am forever grateful. And thank you to Jonathan LaPointe for making the show's awesome graphics. Be sure to check out News Points. It's the division's weekly news service that deliver, delivers, I'm sorry, news stories, special announcements, and ministry resources. It's the one-stop shop on all things North American division. There's no way around it. And you always hear me say it because it's true. So to subscribe, go to nadadventist.org, then click on news. That's nadadventist.org, then click on news. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be your host. That's it for now. Take care.